of the uh, first day of the retreat, or to put it another way, we're just about at the middle of the retreat. <laughs> Which sounds a little bit depressing until you reflect that that's exactly how life feels as well, and then it's a lot depressing. <laughs> So, uh, <clears throat> listening to the, uh, you know, dis discussing with the meditators and listening to the experiences of the meditators during the uh, consult consultations, uh, always learn a lot. And I'd like to uh, maybe respond to a few of the things that came up in those uh, sessions, not on a personal level, but just because often things come up that might be more generally useful as well. One thing that I noticed with a number of people is it seemed to be quite a good, like my, my, my thought at the beginning where I said, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, we forgot without you. Sorry. <laughs> is everyone here now? We got everyone? All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so my thought at the beginning when I said I wasn't going to sort of, you know, be too heavy about teaching meditation methods. I mean, I think that was borne out because a number of people, like it seemed everybody has their own practice, which in a number of cases people have worked out over many years and they found something that works for them. And sometimes they're things that like I've never done and I don't know them. So I wouldn't know, you know, but they obviously work for someone. So that's good. Has anybody heard of the, we discussed this a bit the other day, but has anybody heard of the uh, classic old organic farming book, uh, The One Straw Revolution? If there's any old hippies here, they might know about it. One Straw Revolution, you've heard about it. So One Straw Revolution is a, uh, was published I think in the early 70s or something like that and by a Japanese farmer called Masanobu Fukuaka and well worth a read if you can get it. It's like one of the classics. Uh, and basically his story was that after the Second World War, he uh, returned to his, fa his father's uh, farm to do farming. And he soon realized that the methods that the farmers were using were very destructive to the land. And so he wanted to try to find uh, a more um, a healthy and more... more uh, I don't know if you use the word organic, it was probably a bit early for that, but anyway, a, more, a way of working with the land that wouldn't harm it. And what he discovered that he, he worked out basically four principles. No, let's see if I can remember them, it's a long time since I read it. No tilling the soil, no weeding, no irrigation, and no, what was the last one? Oh, no, no, no like fertilizers or adding anything to the soil. Okay, that was his farming method. So basically you throw the seeds on and then go and have a cup of tea. It's essentially his method. And he, he would, his, the yield of his rice crop was basically the same as all of the other farmers in the district. Right? And they were making all these dikes and bringing all this water in and irrigating it. He didn't do any of that stuff. Right? No kind of water on the fields, nothing like that. Just, just uh, he used to basically just throw the rice on the fields and just let it grow. And of course that greatly appealed to me because I'm very lazy. <laughs> and, but one of the things that's nice about it, you know, when you, it's very beautifully written and he sort of goes through these stories. But at one point he, he tells about how he went to the, like a Zen temple in their local village. And he just went down to visit the temple and maybe light some incense or something. And then he noticed in the back of the temple, like on the back wall, there's these pieces of paper stuck to the back temple, to the back wall. And he went back and he was looking at it and there was all, there's like lots of incense smoke and it's hard to make out and they're old. And he started to read them and make them out and then he realized that these were old haiku and poems written by the local farmers. And he's like, no farmer today has any time to write poetry. 
And so he has this, this, this idea that, that somehow nature is not something that needs to be beaten into submission. Right? But actually nature is abundant and fertile. And so he took this attitude into his farming, but one of the things that he noticed was that one of the lessons that he learned was this. He had inherited uh, part of the farm that he land that he'd inherited was a nashi pear orchard. And in Japan, when they um, grow the nashi pears, they they crop them in a very special way. They basically crop all of the top of the trees off and force the tree to grow in a very broad pattern, uh, which essentially is for the convenience of the fruit pickers. Right? It's not what the tree wants, it's what the fruit pickers want. Uh, and so all these trees like this, and he thought, well, this is not natural for that tree. I'll just let them find their natural state. So he just let them go and let them find their natural state. And it was a complete disaster because they'd been forced so far out of their natural state that the trees couldn't find their way back. And the branches crossed over and they got ruined. And he had to do actually quite a lot of research because like all the Nashi trees had been cut out of whack like this. He couldn't find out what is the natural shape. How does a Nashi tree grow? So this is one lesson that he learned. Right? Sometimes if things have already been put out of shape, we need to do a bit of research. We need to find out what is the natural shape before we can bring it back into that shape. Another lesson that he learned was when he was, uh, uh, they were growing the rice, and the rice was just uh, seedlings, and a plague of locusts came through. And, you know, swarming over all the fields, his farm and all the neighboring farms, and eating all the rice. And so of course, this is a, a farmer's worst nightmare. Right? What do you do? Immediately, all of the other farmers got on their tractors and started driving up and down spraying pesticides. And by the end of the day, all of the locusts on those farms were kind of gone. Well, there's lots of dead locusts, but they're actually like a swarm, so the more of them keep on coming, right? And the second day, and he just looked at it and he didn't know what to do. So he thought, well, can't worry about it. So he just went to, to his home and got a pot of honey and a spoon and sat under a tree and ate honey and watched the locusts eating his rice. <laughs> And the third day, he got up and went out in the morning, and to his amazement, in the rice fields, there were thousands and thousands of spider webs. And these little spiders have come out of nowhere. He'd never seen them before. Suddenly they come out of nowhere, they spin their webs all in the rice, and they're catching all of the locusts. But of course, only in his fields, all the neighboring fields, there's no spiders. So at the end of the day, the locusts only destroyed, a, you know, they damaged a certain percentage of the crop, but most of it was okay. So these are, I think, these are two really nice stories to bear in mind when we're meditating, right? And, we, uh, and it shows us that we can't just apply one solution all of the time. Sometimes, yes, just sit there and watch while the locusts are eating your brain, <laughs> 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 right? But sometimes you've got to get in there and like shift things around and move them around if it's already been put out of whack. Yeah? And so that needs a bit of wisdom and a bit of experience to learn which one is which. Yeah? So now here in this meditation retreat, we give you some structure that's going to you know, keep you safe and keep you, keep you contained. And, but within that structure, there's a lot of freedoms, Partic particularly there's a lot of freedom for the mind. Now imagine if we were to take the stories and the contents of the minds of every single meditator during this day's meditation up till now and make a movie out of it. It'd be very expensive, I imagine, right? <laughs> <laughs> and very complicated and probably x-rated <laughs> <Right? laughs> lots of violence and everything 
So our minds are constantly creating all of these things. You know? And sometimes there are things in the mind that are like locusts and they're doing harm. But just remember, don't be in too much of a rush. Remember, all of that stuff that's going on in your mind is just nature. Actually, there's nothing to it. And this is the thing that's really, it really takes a long time to understand in Buddhism. You see, in Buddhism, we talk about things we call good and bad, right? So the Buddha inherited this, this, this language, like good and bad, punya, apunya, and so on. But the language that the Buddha preferred to use, right, the distinctive language that the Buddha himself used was kusala and akusala. Yeah? Kusala and akusala. Literally, kusala means skillful. Akusala means unskillful. So this has had a lot of interesting implications. And when you think about it, you think about the things that are happening in your mind. You think about the, all the greed, all the hate, all the delusion. Now these things are akusala, they're unskillful. Right? But in a sense, they're not really bad or wrong. Any more than locusts eating rice is bad or wrong. Any more than a flood. It's just nature. And sometimes nature does those things. These things are just a part of nature. And it's just like a shadow side or a dark side of those good qualities that we want to develop. Like greed and love, forgiveness, wisdom. So don't think don't think too much in terms of like, you know, whether this is kind of right or wrong or good or bad, but just actually greed, hate and delusion is nothing. When you look into your mind, it's nothing. It's so weird, right? Because you, oh, where is this stuff coming from? Actually, it's nothing. It's just like a, a flicker. It's just like a, a, like a mirage in your mind. It's, it's there and it's gone. Where is it? Why does it? And you see everything that it drives, everything that it creates. This whole world of desire that we've built around us, this whole world of the wars that we go to because of hate, the whole kind of industries of, of delusion, all of these things driven by these things. And yet, when you look at it in your mind, when you're meditating, there's nothing there. It's just like a flicker of greed or desire or this feeling of hate or something like that. It's, it's just nothing. It's no big deal, actually. But that inside you that does all of those things, that's the same thing that does all of these terrible things you can see in the world. All of the terrible things that humanity has done, it's just greed, hate and delusion. The same thing that you have and that I have. So rather than thinking of these things as good or bad or as anything like that, we have the recognition that this thing leads to suffering. Yeah, that's all. Not good or bad or whatever. I mean, you can think of it in those ways. You can call it that way if you like. But that's not really what matters. What really matters is the fact that this thing will lead to suffering. So this is why we try to let go of it. Greed will lead to suffering. Hate will lead to suffering. Delusion will lead to suffering. And they're opposites. Generosity, love, wisdom, these things will lead to happiness. That's what matters. So spiritual development is not something that you can... Um, let's wait for a minute for the plane. Spiritual development is not something that you can engineer. It's not something that you can. It's not something that you can uh, repeat. It's not something that you can reduce to a formula or to a method or to a list of checkpoints or something like that. It's weird and it's messy and it's organic and it's absolutely different for every person. So the best we can do is set up some guidelines, set up some points of things that are important. And we can encourage people to develop that and to realize that for themselves. But what works for me is not going to work for you. I mean, the general principles, yes, but the specifics and the details. 
I, one of one of the people I was talking to today, I, I was reminded of of a um, a, uh, a point that was made many years ago by uh, the psychologist uh, Ken Wilber, and he made a point which I think was very true about spiritual development, about and about why we often get confused about it. He said that when people are talking about spirituality and spiritual development, that they often talk about two distinct kinds of things. And we don't realize that, and so we get into a confusion and arguments about it. Sometimes, when we talk about spiritual development, what we mean is some specific spiritual practice or spiritual thing, right? which might be, say, meditation practice, or it might be um, study of a scripture, or something like that. So it's something that we specifically do as a spiritual practice. And you can come along here for a few days and you can get a highly specialized environment where we can set up all of these conditions to help you in your meditation. And you can, yes, after a few days, find that peaceful state of mind. You think, oh yes, I've improved in my meditation. You think, oh yes, I'm growing spiritually. That's one aspect or one way of talking about spiritual direct, uh, development. But the other aspect, is that spiritual development is not any one thing or any kind of thing, but spiritual development is how everything, every aspect of who you are, fits in together. This is what they call integration. Right? How all the different parts of your life, all the different parts of who you are, fit together and match up and all the different parts of your mind talk to each other and work together. Yeah. This is another meaning of spiritual development and more powerful meaning I think of spiritual development and this is what the Eightfold Path is about right so the Eightfold Path is not just about specifically spiritual kinds of things right yes it does have some things like meditation or something like that sure but it also has something like right livelihood okay right livelihood now, right livelihood for us is relatively easy, right? We just walk down the street with our bowl and hopefully somebody gives us some food and that's about it, right? But for you guys, right livelihood is hard, right? Because you've got to earn a living and you've got to do a job that's ethical for a company that's ethical. And that's a slippery slope, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, that's not easy. I mean, any you know, even even you know, supposedly good things, you're going to get caught up in something sooner or later. Yeah, and it's an area I think where our generation has really shifted and changed compared to previous generations. Again, think of that story of Masanobu Fukuoka and the farmers who could had time to write their haiku and put them in the temple. Yeah, farming is right livelihood because you're growing food to feed people. And not only is it right livelihood, you actually see it. It's a meaningful form of livelihood. You know, I grew up in the city, like I'm sure most of you, and you don't really feel it, right? I mean, we can grow, we can grow a few veggies in our backyard. We grew some veggies in our backyard when I was growing up. We had a fig tree and these kinds of things. Not much, just a little bit. But when I was in Thailand, and I was staying in the forest monastery in the village there in Bung Wai, one of the most joyous days of the year is when they complete the sticky rice harvest. And the first harvest of the year, they bring it in and they offer it to the monks. And there's this big celebration, right? And everyone eats, shares the, the first rice of the year. And you can just see how, that, how meaningful that is for the whole community, yeah? meaningful for us because it's delicious and <laughs> meaningful for them because they get to share their work and it's not just to the monks but it's the whole community and all the village comes and the family is there and everyone and they say it's such such hard work growing rice is such hard work I mean there's a reason why we all choose to do middle-class jobs when we get the chance right because working out in the fields is bloody hard So it's hard, but you see the results of it. These days we're so detached very often, not everyone obviously, but in many, many cases we're very detached from the results of what our work is. I mean, even I'm like that with Sutta Central, you know, we do work for Sutta Central and 
most of the people who use it I don't even see right I don't know and so I think it's really important that we get that get some get we, we, we reunite these things this is part of that idea of spiritual development and you see why I mention that now is that for, for many of you I'll just wait for the plan For many of you, probably most of you, you've come here and left aside your job or whatever other kind of livelihood that you might be doing, and you know that that'll still be rattling around in your mind for a while, right? Yeah, so Anupama's going to a new job in a few days, so she's probably worried about the <laughs> what's going to happen there or whatever, and so and, so, and we feel this tension, and we feel this need to set up these kind of conditions, like a meditation center or a meditation retreat or something like that and we very often feel like oh, I'm going to go to that retreat because you know that will give me a chance to have a bit of a break from my job a bit of a de-stressing and that kind of thing right but think about it is not right livelihood part of the eightfold path why do we need to find a break from you're doing your job is just as much a part of the Eightfold Path as sitting meditation why is it that my practice is something that I need to do that's separate from my job actually your job is quite literally straightforwardly right there smack bang in the middle of the Noble Eightfold Path and so an integrated path means that when you come home from your job you're like wow that was so good I got to help so many people. I got to join together with these colleagues to do this really exciting work. And I got to, to earn a paycheck or whatever it is the way you do livelihood. I, I got to earn this money in a way that's honest, where I felt that I had a sense of honor and dignity about the way I did my work. I treated people with decency, honesty, and fairness. And I actually did something meaningful. And then you, that gives you a sense of joy, which you can then bring in and support your meditation. Yeah? So your meditation should be supported by your livelihood, not obstructed by it. And like I said before, I mean, it's relatively easy for us as, as monks and nuns. We can do that, right? Because we can reflect on the work we do in teaching Dharma or looking after the center and these things, and it's easy for us. For you guys, it's more complicated. It's harder, yeah? So I don't have any answers for you, and I know that everybody here is in a different situation, and you know what I say is not going to apply equally or exactly to everyone. But just something for you to think about, rather than thinking of our spiritual practice and our work and our worldly life as being two separate things which are in tension, right, pulling apart from each other, then we think of them as things which are coming closer together. Like as our spiritual development deepens, then we'll see less of a conflict between these things. And we'll see more how these things support each other. Because one thing that I can tell you, as, as, as you know, I've been a monk for a little bit now, what is it, 25 years? So I should have learned something, right? <laughs> you'd think, huh? you'd think. One thing that I have learned that if, is that if I, if I see someone coming to the monastery who says, ah, oh, I'm going to go and meditate all day and get enlightened I'm like oh go on okay if you must because <laughs> this kinds of things it's driven by the, it's, it's unbalanced and you find once you start to peel away the layers it's always driven by some you know negativity some escape from something escaping from some trauma or something like that who knows right I don't want to you don't try to you know overly psychoanalyze people if they come to the monastery but we just try to understand that 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 those kinds of really kind of uh, 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 like kind of excessive or goal oriented approaches to meditation, approaches to spiritual practice, you know, they're not balanced and they don't end up well. You know? The thing that is the most hopeful sign for me, if I'm staying in a monastery and somebody wants to come and stay and practice is if they come and they say, oh, look, I'm interested to come and stay to see what it's about, and, you know, hopefully I might learn something. Thank you! <laughs> right? That's the kind of attitude, not to be kind of imposing too much on it. And so that's the same kind of thing in our meditation. Keep, keep that idea of like that, 
that understanding and that inquiry. A number of people, when I've been talking to them in their meditation, so one of the first things for most of you, when I, when I asked you about your meditation, right? I said, how's it going? How's your meditation, right? Now, what I'm looking for, I don't really care how your meditation is, actually. It's a trick question. This is a trick question. I'm giving you the meditation teacher's secrets now, <laughs> okay? I don't care too much how you describe what your meditation is. What I'm look, sorry, I don't care how much what you say about your meditation. And what I'm looking for is how you talk about it. Right? Because if you sit there and you go, oh yeah, it's a kind of, yeah, it's, a, it's nice, well, yeah, kind of, uh, then that tells me something about your clarity of understanding. Yeah? And if somebody's able to describe to me, oh, this is how my meditation is. I start out like this, I go like this. If this is happening, then I feel like that. If that's happening, I feel like this. Sometimes the meditation goes like this or else this happens. And someone gives me a nice clear description of it. Ah, okay. Okay, that person's got some awareness. They're not just sitting there by rote, going through the method and falling asleep. Yeah? I'm giving away the trade secrets now. So... <laughs> <laughs> the ones who are doing the uh, interviews tomorrow will be sitting and make, taking notes about how can they can <laughs> how, how they can get good marks at their meditation interview. <laughs> right. So uh, learn to understand what's going on in your mind. Right. This is why we should we, we, we always at the end of meditation we should learn to reflect back and review back on the meditation. Understand what's going on. Why is it peaceful? Why is it agitated? Why sometimes sometimes your body sort of feels hot, you're meditating and your body starts to burn up. Why is it like that? You don't necessarily have to find answers to these questions, right? Sometimes it's just kind of weird. Sometimes it's mysterious, it's okay. And even if you find answers, you don't have to necessarily verbalize them. But just to awaken the inquiring mind, just to look at it and see what's going on. This is the whole point of it. The whole point of what we're doing is to understand our mind so that we become, become free of it. Um, not to just go along doing the same old thing again and again and again. Now, uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, discuss a little bit uh, also today, and it's a bit similar to just seeing a few people here who were at my talk the other day and I, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to repeat myself too much but anyway I'll probably repeat myself too much so there you go uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we talk about meditation and you know one of the things about like when I'm traveling around I'm going and I'm teaching different places and so on I, I don't want to tell you the same things that everybody else is telling you because that would be just too boring so I'm going to tell you something different Right? And what I'm going to tell you is that everything that you've ever heard and said to yourself about meditation is probably wrong. <laughs> is that enough? <laughs> probably want some explanation, right? Okay. <laughs> probably wrong why why and this is one thing that we we, we kind of forget or the kind of uh, trap or conceit actually it's conceit really is where it comes from we have this conceit as meditators because we believe that our meditation is based on experience and we believe that our experience is something which is real and true however and of course that's not completely wrong, but it's not completely right as well because our experience is shaped by our ideas and our ideas are shaped by the words that we have heard. Remember the old Zen saying, the Zen saying is, you know, the finger is pointing to the moon. Right? So it's not about the finger, it's about the moon. Right? But we tend to make a category mistake right? and then think, oh, the finger doesn't matter. But without the finger, we'd never see the moon, right? The finger actually matters, and the finger is, of course, the Dhamma teachings. So the Dhamma teachings matter because they're the ones who are pointing to our experience and also shaping experience. Again, think about it. You know, the kinds of words that we say 
shape, they don't just, they don't just point us in a direction, but they actually change what that experience is. Right? I mean, if I was sitting here saying very hateful words and riling up anger and things like that, your experience would be different. You're, you would feel that anger and it would be an actual reality that you can experience. But because we use different words, it creates a different response in our mind, a different emotional response, and we have a different experience. <coughs> the words that we use to talk about meditation mostly were taken from, were developed in the 20th century through the encounter of uh, Western students with the Burmese Vipassana movements. Now, I don't want to go too much into the sort of background and history of that, but I just want to point to the fact that there is a specific cultural and historical context for why we meditate and why we meditate the way that we do. Right? And the language and ideas that's emerged from that interaction have shaped the way that we talk about meditation at a very fundamental level and that completely shapes the way that we actually meditate in the experiences that we have because of our meditation and not always in a good way tell me if you've if this sounds familiar <clears throat> and not those those of you who heard my talk the other day you're not allowed to cheat right <laughs> Okay, so let's assume that you're doing breath meditation. Okay, just, just because it's common meditation. So, here I am. How do we talk about this? First of all, okay, let's take the breath as the object of our meditation. F fair enough? Is that right? Bzz, wrong. Okay, the Buddha never used the word object. Okay? A million, I've just translated a million words from Pali into English. <laughs> And I can tell you that there is no word for object in that sense. I mean, obviously, there's a simple word for an object like that. But there's no word for an object in the sense of a meditation object or an object of mind in the suttas. And yet, it's so, it's so ingrained in us to think that way. Right? I mean, it's problematic. As soon as you say the breath is an object, what, what, does the, what connotations does the word object has? Well, the word object has a connotation that something exists objectively. Like this glass is an object. It sort of it sits out there. It, it just is. Whether I'm here or not doesn't really change it. But your breath isn't like that. Right? Your breath is something that is part of you. It's not a thing. It doesn't exist objectively. In fact, your breath isn't really a thing at all. Your breath is a behavior. It's an energy, it's a movement, it's a pattern, it's a rhythm. It's not an object. So that way of talking about things as objects was ultimately derived from the Pali Abhidhamma, which uses that kind of language a lot. But it's not found in the suttas. So we have our object. So I'm in here watching the object, right? You're all nervous already, right? <laughs> So I'm in, uh, right? Fair enough, right? I have breath in my object. I'm in here watching the object. And, and while a number of people said this during the interviews, that while you're here, I'm watching the object, and then all of these thoughts come in, right? Sitting there meditating, all of these thoughts wander past, right? <laughs> Where do they wander from? Does it ever occur to anybody to wonder what's happening here? Where are the thoughts coming from? Does anybody know? You're sitting and meditating. Where do the thoughts come from? Is it from like the government? <laughs> <laughs> Aliens? Where did the thoughts come from? Surely it's a simple question. You're allowed to answer. <laughs> they come from your mind. Thank you so very much. Excellent. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So the thoughts come from mind. So again, you think about how strange this is, right? When I when I'm talking to people about meditation, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Okay. You, you sit there. I'm sitting here. I'm trying to concentrate on the object of meditation, on the breath of my object. All of these thoughts keep wandering in and distracting me. 
I mean, the way we have of talking about it, it's so common, right? I caught a flight into Perth and I got picked up by a taxi driver called Chris. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Just shout out to Chris, the taxi driver. Lovely guy. <laughs> how's it going, Chris? What's up? Oh, you do some meditation. How's your meditation? Well, look, I'm really trying to concentrate on my breath, but as soon as I do that, then all of these thoughts keep coming in. I know exactly how you feel, Chris. Is that everyone talks about meditation in, in the same way. It's very strange. And you know, what I found, when I, well, I've, I've taught this in Sydney many times, and you know, I will teach this to a group of people, and I'll say, look, let's have a completely different way of looking at it. Let's not use this language anymore. Okay, I'm sitting here watching my breath, I'm trying to keep this object in mind, I'm trying to focus on this object, and all of these thoughts keep coming in. And let's do it. And what happens is that at the end of the talk, and I kid you not, somebody will stand up and say, look, that's all very well, but when I'm trying to meditate, I just keep trying to focus on the breath, and when I can't keep my mind on the object and all of these thoughts come in. I've just given the whole talk about that. <laughs> right? And again, I kid you not, this is really true, and if you don't believe me, you can contact Deepika in Sydney and double check, fact check this if you like. I gave the talk about this. I said that at the end of it. I said, this is what people will ask about, about doing this. And then somebody got up and asked about it. <laughs> this is how deeply ingrained it is. Right? These patterns of thinking, patterns of using the mind. It took me years. It took me nearly 20 years to, to, to really kind of notice this. But once you notice it, you realize how actually weird and unnecessary it is. I mean, for a start, right? You've got the object out here, okay? I'm in here. Who's, the, who's in here, actually? If the object is out there, who's this in here? And then all of these thoughts are coming in. <laughs> but, like, they're not my thoughts, right? And you can see people really resist the idea of thinking that these are my thoughts. I talked about this when I was in, in California to one of the groups there. And people were saying that they've never heard anything like this before. They, they like this idea that these thoughts are theirs. It never occurred to them. They've been meditating for years. So what does that mean? What does it tell us? Right? What it tells us is that when you're meditating, the language, the language is causing us to divide our mind into little pieces. I'm in here, my object is out there. I've ripped that out of my heart through language and placed it there. And then these thoughts, which actually are something that I'm doing, I'm creating, these are now out there and they're happening to me. I'm the victim of my thoughts. Right? I'm the victim of my thoughts. They happen to me. And I'm in here, so I'm in here, so who's this? If I'm not my thoughts and I'm not the, the object, what actually is left over? Who is this in here and why does the one in here so much want to do all of this complicated stuff? Who's the one in here? Does anyone want to take a guess? Who's left over? Who's the one watching? The answer? will disturb you. It will harrow, yes, your very soul. <laughs> Maybe not. Sorry, go on. Max. <laughs> I guess from what you're saying, it's like illusion, is it? Like, like reflection of the thoughts in a way. Or... Okay. Anyone else? What do you reckon? Who's the one in here that's watching? The observer. Okay. But who? Right? But who is that? Who is it you're observing? I think the point is not really the thought in this person I'm saying, we use Lung Sui as the ego. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The one who's left over is the good one. Right? I'm the one who's meditating. Ah, right? <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the pure one. I'm just watching this. You see, I'm not thinking these thoughts. Because these thoughts are bad and nasty, and that wouldn't be me, right? I'm just watching. 
So these thoughts are distracting me. Me being the pure one, the meditator, who's sitting in here watching these things. These thoughts are coming in and disturbing me from my meditation. Right? See, listen to how we talk about it. Actually, that that watching, this is our conceit. This is this this what's left over is our, our idea of some kind of perfect meditator self who is separate from all of these bad things. So now do you begin to understand why meditation is such hard work? Because you have to construct all of this stuff to keep that going. Why? Why? What's powering it? What's powering it is your need to see yourself as being the pure one who's sitting there meditating. Huh? Huh. It's a lot, isn't it? Right? It's a lot. So what do we do? Well, interestingly enough, when the Buddha talked about meditation, he didn't talk about meditation like that at all. He didn't talk about an object of meditation. He didn't talk about focusing on an object or focusing on something. He didn't talk about thoughts coming in and distracting you or any of it. He didn't talk about like trying to focus on something. No, none of that language that he used. When the Buddha talked about breath meditation, so sato va asasati, sato pasasati. Mindful, one breathes in. Mindful, one breathes out. That's it. You don't need all of that stuff. You don't need to think about meditation in all that, all that way. Just breathe mindfully. Many years ago, I was at an interfaith event and somebody said words, something that, that really stuck with me at this time. They said, God is an adverb. Maybe it's because I'm kind of a grammar nerd or whatever, but it really struck me, God is an adverb, right? In other words, our religious or spiritual life is not about what we do, it's about how we do it. Right? Divinity is not what you do, it's not a thing, it's, what, it's how you do it, it's how you live. And it's the same thing with breathing. The meditation is not a thing, it's not an object, it's not something to be got or attained, it's just how you breathe. With mindfulness. That's it. Now, I've been talking in the context of breath meditation, but of course, the same thing applies in any other meditation context, the same kind of idea. So whatever meditation that you're doing, just bear this in mind. Again, this isn't going to necessarily change anything. You'll still meditate and still do exactly the same things you were doing before. Whatever method you're doing, whatever, doesn't matter. But just change the way that you think about it a little bit. Change the way you approach it a little bit. Instead of thinking that there's this thing which is separate from me that I have to try to concentrate on, it's actually everything that's happening is just part of who you are already. That's all. And then by just accepting all of that, then you can be at peace. So another one of the stories that I like to tell about this is from... Where did I last tell? I told this story recently. Where did I last tell this story? Anyway, I can't remember. I can't remember. Anyway, if I'm repeating myself, just uh, tell me to shut up. But uh, one of the um, one of the uh, uh, again one of those kind of little in insights that come to you in unexpected ways. See, I like I like things that come to you in places that you don't really think that you know don't really look for them. Now, I was reading. Uh, a book that was talking about a particular uh, controversy in uh, medieval Indian aesthetic theory. Okay? So, now, if you know Indians, especially Indian philosophers, you know that they like to argue with each other, like, a lot. And they like to write very, very, very long books 
about all of their differences. Right? And they like to categorize things. So you've got all these categorizations of everything. So in art theory, they had this theory of what they call the rasa. And the rasa is like a, f literally means flavor, but it's a bit like a genre that we have in kind of Western art. Right? And so you can have all these different rasas for something. But the rasas are much more subtle than the rasas that we have in the kind of Western aesthetic theory. Now, everybody agrees that a good work of art must have a dominant rasa. Okay, so it might be uh, comedy, right? Uh, the one of the one of the rasas, for example, is uh, love in separation, right? So this is has to be the kind of dominant flavor of it. But the biggest problem, the thorniest problem in aesthetic theory, was the Mahabharata, because the Mahabharata is this huge work that includes everything in it. It's got war. It's got love, it's got magic, it's got gambling, it's got catastrophe, it's got dogs, it's got everything you could possibly want, and many other things as well. How can you say that Mahabharata has a particular flavour? I mean, it's like a kind of a soup that you've just thrown everything in, and it just tastes like soup, right? it doesn't really taste like anything. but. But the Mahabharata, everyone also agrees, is the greatest work of art. So how can the greatest work of art have no flavour, have no rasa? And everybody would argue back and forth about which particular rasa the Mahabharata had. Until one philosopher came along and said, the rasa of the Mahabharata is the Shanta rasa. The Shanta rasa. And he just invented this. This had not been talked about before in the theory. The Shanta rasa, the flavour of peace. And of course, this is outrageous. How can you say Mahabharata has the flavor of peace? I mean, it's a war story. It's about these great battles and slaughters and all of these kinds of things. How can you say it has the flavor of peace? It has so much chaos and so much of all of these things in it. And then the answer is, of course, that's why it has the flavor of peace. Because it accepts all of those things. It doesn't judge. It doesn't say, this is part of human experience and this isn't. This is allowable, this isn't. This is justified, this isn't. It just accepts everything and says everything is a part of it. Because everything is a part of the human story. That's why it has the Shantarasa. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that if we took all of the stories in all of the minds of all of the meditators in this day on the retreat, we could make them into big epic. We're probably nearly as big as the Mahabharata already from all the stories that you've got. When we can accept all of those, when we can realize it's just part of being human, it's okay. We don't have to control it. We don't have to get rid of it. We don't have to do anything. It's just part of being human. Then we can be at peace. Because the secret, the big secret to meditation, Sabesankara Anicca, all conditions are impermanent. Their nature is to rise and pass away. Having arisen, they cease. Their stilling is bliss. This is how we find happiness and joy in our meditation. It's not our job to stop the thoughts. It's not our job to get rid of the parts of our mind that we don't like. Those things will pass away by themselves because they are impermanent. There's nothing we can do about it. We couldn't keep them there if we tried. They must pass away. So our job is just to get out of the way, to hold the space, and to just allow it to settle and settle and settle. And when we do that, then we will find peace. Okay, so a few words on peace and related topics. Now, 
let me see if I can answer some questions. So I'm not going to promise to answer all of them. All right. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Is the chanting in Pali, does it serve a purpose or is it just tradition? Um, also, is knowing writing, is knowing Pali or Sanskrit just necessary for translators? Well, does it serve a purpose? I don't know. I like it. Does it I don't know if you say serves a purpose. I find it peaceful and uplifting. I enjoy it. Um, I think it's more that, that it provides a sense of focus and a sense of uh, reflection for the community. Uh, I mean, if you don't like chanting in Pali or whatever, that's okay. We're not doing so much. You can just sort of be quiet for a little while and it's all right. But it also is nice because if you do get familiar with the Pali chants, then when you travel around and you go around, you stay in different places, you can go and join different communities, visit different temples and join in with the chanting there. That's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. So, and it's nice to get a familiarity with the, the language that the Buddha used. You know, you're getting some kind of feel for it. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it's really necessary, but uh, I like it. I mean, you know, when, when Buddhism went to like China or the Tibet, they completely left behind the Indic languages, right? So everything was translated into Chinese and they do all the chanting in Chinese or whatever. And uh, in Tibet, they do it in Tibetan. So it's not really necessary to keep those original languages. Oh my God. Out of curiosity, has there been an enlightened being in the recent past? If so, where are they? <laughs> <laughs> and how do I find them on Facebook? Well, <laughs> there are some, there are some uh, arahants and Buddhas and things like that that you can contact on Facebook. Well, some, well, some people who say they're arahants and so on on their Facebook profile, whether that means they're actually arahants and Buddhas. <laughs> I mean, actually, if you would, I think that how many users does Facebook have now? Two billion users or something? I think if you were to get all of those two billion people, the least likely to be enlightened would be the ones who are calling themselves enlightened out of those two billion. <laughs> They'd be like, go through the other two billion first and get to those guys at the end. Anyway, um, are there enlightened beings in the recent past? Maybe even in the present, right? I hope so. There's only, the problem with that is that there's really only one way to be sure. And that's to get enlightened yourself. <laughs> so, okay. If you feel like you're floating away in meditation, can you still be present or do we need to be grounded in our bodies? Okay, so feeling of floating away in meditation is a quite a common experience. Um, sometimes you can be like f really feeling like you're floating up from your seat and floating up in the air. Maybe you are, okay? <laughs> so do not open your eyes. <laughs> All right? Because it could be a rough landing, okay? <laughs> okay? This is something, this has genuine practical implications. Okay, I'll tell you a story. There was a, one of the Jataka stories concerns a certain Rishi. So j for those of you who don't know, Jataka stories are, are stories which are told in the Buddhist tradition which are uh, attributed to be past lives of the Buddha. In fact, most of them or almost all of them are folk tales and fables of one sort or another that get adopted into the Buddhist tradition and uh, said to be the Buddha in his past lives. Uh, and so they're not really meant to be necessarily stories of perfect beings or perfect behavior or anything like that, but stories of people sort of on their various uh, kind of uh, uh, sometimes uh, problematic journeys towards enlightenment. Anyhow, so there's this one Rishi who's uh, like a sage who was reputed to have great meditation. He was invited by the king to come and stay in the palace grounds. And he had a little kuti in the palace grounds. This actually is a custom which was kept up till quite, oh, still kept today, I think, or certainly until quite recently in Thailand. There was a kuti on the palace grounds. They invite a forest monk to stay there. And because this monk had great psychic powers, 
the king and queen used to offer a dana to him, used to offer the meal to him on the top floor of the palace. Uh, so the palaces in those days would have like a, um, uh, like a, a roof or something. So he would use his psychic powers and he would fly up to the roof, get the day's meal and then fly back down to his kuti. Right? I mean, that's how to do it, right? <laughs> I mean, they were pretty cool in those days. Yeah? <laughs> so one day when he, this monk had to go up to do this, this get his meal, uh, the king was away and it was just the queen who came to meet him. And when she came to meet him, she, she slipped and her, her, the top of her robe fell off and she exposed herself to him. And when he saw, he'd flown up and he saw her, suddenly all of those pure thoughts that he had in his mind weren't so pure anymore. <laughs> so after he got the meal, he said, well, I think I'll have to take the stairs today. <laughs> 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 so let that be a warning to you, okay? Um, so floating away meditation um, can that kind of that kind of sensation can come from a number of different things. So sometimes it can be a feeling of what we call rapture. Most often, it's a feeling of what we call rapture is when you you rapture is a sense of joy and uplift that you feel in your body. What rapture is really is a kind of uh, it's a kind of emotional response to the meditation. When your meditation is getting peaceful, then your mind starts to get elated. And that elation and excitement can manifest in a lot of different ways. It might be like shivers or hair standing up on end, or it might be you get like a tremor in your body or feel like electricity. So many different forms, okay? Now, n none of those matter all that much right this is just these are just sort of symptoms of that response so the kind of piti that we're looking for the kind of rapture that we're looking for is very settled and very even it's more mature right and that will that will gradually come it will gradually evolve but one of the forms sometimes rapture will feel make your body feel very heavy like you're feeling like you're really solid like a rock sometimes you might feel like you're expanding like blowing up like the michelin man uh, and sometimes you might feel like you're floating up from your seat so if that happens, that's okay. Just stay with it. Keep being mindful and just allow that process to go through. Okay? Just allow the process to go through. I think more rarely uh, somebody might have something like an out-of-body experience or something like that in meditation. And these things do happen, but not, they're, not so, they're not like the kind of rapture responses are quite a normal part of the development of meditation. Out-of-body experiences are much more specific like a, s a few people that they, these thing, things seem to happen to you so if you think that that's happening to you probably best to come and talk to me and I'll, I'll, I'll just you know talk about what's going on uh, but it's you know I think quite unusual okay right what do you think about ceremonial use of psychedelics for spiritual growth <laughs> uh, well obviously this is American Buddhism yeah. <laughs> Curiously enough, curiously enough, not often acknowledged that not only, of course, you know, American meditation, of course, grew out of all the hippies in the, seven, in the 60s who were taking drugs and then basically wore off and then they're like, okay, so how can we do this but without the whole kind of getting addicted and stuff part of it. But interesting, that seems to have been the way that meditation evolved in India as well. In the oldest strata of the Indian texts, they talk a lot about soma and soma is a kind of drug. <laughs> right, the original entheogen, and the identity of soma is not entirely clear. It may have been a number of different substances, but it seems that the most likely candidate these days that people say is it's a kind of a phaedra, like uh, related to uh, methamphetamine, but in a natural form. So basically, a stimulant which was taken by the warriors before they'd go into battle. Right. But when the Indo-European people arrived in India, they couldn't find the Soma anymore. So a lot of the Vedic hymns are about the death of Soma, people lamenting the fact that Soma has abandoned them and left them. And so it seems like they probably used this drug in their rituals to give some kind of heightened awareness or something. And then when the drug disappeared, then they sort of figured out other ways of doing it. And 
obviously meditation being one of those ways. So what do I think about ceremonial use of psychedelics for spiritual growth? Look, do I think it's a good idea? Probably not. Uh, do I think it's like the worst idea in the world? Also probably not. I think that if you're doing something like that in a, in a sort of moderate controlled way, in a ceremonial form, like that's, that's the traditional way that drugs have been used in human societies. The real problem with drugs is that we've taken them out of that context and we just kind of unleash them on the general population for everyone to take just because they want to get high. So I don't, do I think that, I think that if, personally I think that if you're a meditator, if you're exposed to meditation and you know what you're doing with meditation, that's a bit of a waste of time and it can be dangerous. Um, you know, remembering that, you know, these days I think there's a lot of, a lot of, like, like we want to do it because it's kind of cool and it's wild and you're getting in touch with nature and the whole kind of Native American thing and all of these kinds of things. But remember, that's not your culture also. So that even though you can participate in it to some degree, but it's not really how it was for those people in that time. I mean, they're going through a process which was really, you know, quite embedded in their own experience. So personally, I would say just do meditation instead. But if you do some psychedelics, make sure you do it in a safe way uh, and uh, within a particular context. Do you think ancient Buddhists ever used psychedelic substance in this way? N no, but like I said before, I think pre-Buddhist meditation uh, may have done. Probably, almost certainly did do. Are there some people who are better suited to take on the monastic path? Oh, absolutely. Is there, such as, is there such a thing as being monk material? <laughs> Generally speaking, cotton. Uh, what makes for a successful monk? You know, when, when I, when, I hate, say, hate saying these stories, when I was a young monk, uh, we, we had it tough. The young monks of today, they don't understand. Uh, so yes, when I was a young monk, <laughs> we used to joke about having the the uh, um, what do we call it the Mr. Biku competition, right? So every year there'd be a Mr. Biku, like a word for monk is Biku, so we'd have Mr. Biku competition. So who gets to win at being a monk for the year? Um, it was in fact a joke. Uh, okay, so is this not something being? Look, I think it's a vocation. I don't think it's about you know being better or worse or anything like that. It's a calling, and if you feel that that calling is something that appeals to you, then great. If not, that's also fine. But I think one of the interesting things about having a monastic monastic people around is that it 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 it, it calls you to ask that question. That's the point, right? You know, we even, you know, we feel that and we're conscious of that when we're just walking through the streets or something like that. People see it and they go, what's that? Right? What's going on? Oh, Avatar, they say. <laughs> <laughs> it's better, like it always used to be Hare Krishna, right? Now it's Avatar. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a change anyway, right? Anyone here a fan of Avatar? You know what it is? Is there like a catchphrase or something? That's what I was thinking. That people are saying, oh, Avatar, we should have a catchphrase to say back to them. Like, you know, live long and prosper or something, but it's the wrong <laughs> franchise, right? I'll get back to is, is there something? Okay, so if there is one, that would be good. Okay. Uh, anyway. Where were we? Uh, oh, yeah, being monk material. So, yeah, it's about that. It's about that thing like saying, could there be something else? You know, I, I think when I think back to my own encounter with Buddhism, right? My first memory of Buddhism, actually one of the oldest memories I have, must be from. It's just I can think see it now. It's an image in my mind. It must be from a documentary on the ABC, the Australian National Broadcaster, probably in the mid to late seventies. Uh, and I remember a picture of a woman, Australian woman, with a shaved head. Uh, she, in, in my mind, she was sitting in a car, being driven somewhere, or doing something like that, and she was a Buddhist nun. And I'd never seen anything like this. Uh, and uh, that's all I remember. I can't remember who it was, or what she was doing, or what the documentary was about, or anything, but that image has stuck with me. And uh, I've asked around in the Buddhist community in Australia, there weren't that many Australian Buddhist nuns in the 1970s, so I'd hoped that I might be able to find out who it was and, and see if I could say thank you to her, because that's planted some kind of seed. And I just remember, like I remember that image, 
just her, her face or her head and just this, this kind of sense of wonder. What the? <laughs> what? what, what? Right? Why, why would you do that? Right? Oh. Okay. Should enlightenment be the sole aim of meditation? Hmm. I don't know if it's an either or thing, really. I mean, the whole point about the Buddhist path is it's not about, you know, I'm going to get to enlightenment or something like that. But it's like by developing something that's wholesome and abandoning what's unwholesome here and now, then I understand that this is what will lead to enlightenment. So, uh, what does the appearance of beings during practice signify? Okay, so this is, uh, again, a good question. Thanks for whoever asked that. Uh, so it's quite common in meditation for uh, different people to have some kind of like a feeling or a vision or a something, some kind of presence that feels like some kind of invisible being or something like that. So people feel like they're being visited by spirits or being visited by devas or something like that. Now, personally, I've never had this kind of experience, so it's not my, not my back, but it's not uncommon. So the first thing to know is that it's normal and it's okay. Now second thing people want to know is is it real right are these actual real beings coming to see me right or is this just something that's produced by my mind must be kind of hard to say isn't it when i was in thailand and so if you want to, to know about that I, I, all i can do is tell you my experience now like i said i never had that kind of experience meditators are different and everyone has different kinds of experiences in their meditation so my experiences always tend to be very kind of body focused and my meditation went through like seeing like sort of emotions and feelings and insights and things that's focused in the body and that kind of experience. Other people's meditation is more visually orientated. And when I was in Thailand a number of years ago, I visited my meditation teacher, Ajahn Mahachachai, uh, together with my, uh, a monk who was a friend of mine. And that was a monk who did have more of a kind of sort of visual orientation in his meditation and like seeing visions and things. And when we talked with Ajahn Mahachachai, um, he asked us both, uh, do you, no, sorry, actually, I asked the monk who was with me, my friend, he said, do you believe in rebirth? Right? So do you believe that there are beings in other realms? And he said, yes, I do believe that. And Ajahn Mahachachai said, but you just take it on faith, don't you? He said, well, yeah. <laughs> he said, well, you shouldn't just take it on faith. You should find out for yourself. So what you should do when you meditate, and if you, if you have a particularly powerful or clear meditation, then you make a determine in your, determination in your mind that if there are any spirits or any beings that are in this vicinity, especially uh, beings or consciousness of anybody who has recently passed away, then ask that they can appear to you in, your, in the meditation so that you can see them. And a monk said, okay, but how do I know that I'm just not making things up? Right? It could be just, just my projection, right? It's just wishful thinking. And, he, and Ajahn Chachai said, well, what you do is you, you, you get as much information from that being as you can. Okay, now sometimes it might be just their appearance. Sometimes it might be just a feeling. Sometimes you might be able to ask them questions, right? Depends. People have lots of different kinds of experience. And when you get that information, then you check it out. You find out, was there a person of that name? Did they die at such and such a time? Find, if there's a, a person, find a photo of them. See, did they look like that? Yeah. So you investigate it and find it out. So if you want to know, are these things real or not? That's how you know. Yeah. Check it out and find it out. And tell us the stories when you're done. <laughs> and then we asked him, you know, did, have you ever done this? He said, yeah, I did this so many times I got bored of it. <laughs> so... If you, if you see these kinds of things, you know, what, if you, I think it's important to know that it is a normal part of meditation. Obviously, in many cases, it's just an internal vision and an internal projection, right? Don't think that there's anything which is worrying or distressing about it. Um, if the experience, but look at the, the, the tone of the experience, the emotional tone of the experience. If, if the beings feel threatening or weird or something like that in some kind of way, then do some metta, spread some metta to them, this kind of thing. 
never forget that you're the one who's in control right they've come to see you for a reason you're not going to see them right that means that you're the one who actually has the power yeah? I'll tell you a story about this uh, this is in the biography I think biography of Carl Jung the psychologist in biography anyway a story about him I think it was in his autobiography or something anyway uh, his mother died Jung's mother died and then a number of years later his father died and uh, Jung in a dream or something I can't remember exactly his father came to him in a dream and Jung was like really excited he's like wow this is proof that the afterlife exists and he wanted to ask his father all these questions about what is it like and was he in heaven and what was going on and his father was like curiously uninterested in answering any of those kinds of questions and instead he said to Jung, to his son, he said, you know, I hear you've, be, you, you, you've become a, a great and famous psychologist. You help many people with their problems. And uh, Jung said, yes, that, that's true. Uh, and the, and then, then, then Jung's father said to him, well, you know, where I'm here, I've been, I've been reunited with your mother after all of these years. Jung said, okay. And he said, well, you know, we never really got along all that well. <laughs> uh, and I was wondering if you had any advice for me. <laughs> True story. So, so If, if you find that these experiences happen like once or twice and these things happen, it's just something interesting, don't worry about it too much. If you find that they're happening a lot, or especially if it's something which is really distressing or something like that, then best to come to one of us and just talk to us about it, okay? And just sort of see. And most of the time we'll just go, oh, okay, that's interesting, and you keep going. But, do, but just, it's just important because sometimes, sometimes if you have things like happen in your meditation that might be very unusual or very weird, then you can, you can feel isolated because of that. Like you feel like you're having some kind of strange experience that nobody else is having. But actually remember this, this path of meditation has been trod by many people. And the chances are, no matter how weird your experience, that somebody else has had something like it before. Okay, that's the substance one. This is this one. Oh, I think we're doing pretty well actually. This is this one. Floating away. Hang on, maybe I've got them backwards, back to front. Maybe these are the last ones. Okay, so this one. So what is my preferred meditation technique? Uh, well, I like doing a metta, a loving kindness meditation, uh, and I kind of mix it up. I usually do metta meditation, sometimes breathing meditation, sometimes uh, like uh, vipassana, like contemplating impermanence. Uh, sometimes four elements meditation as well. Uh, do you use any particular breathing technique during walking meditation? Uh, no. Uh, so sometimes when people are doing walking meditation, they will like connect the breathing with the walking, with the steps as they're going, they use it as a way to help uh, ground themselves. So that's one method. I, I have done that method in the past, but these days, when I do walking meditation, I just sort of just basically just get into the rhythm of walking. So I don't really do any other kind of meditation, just, just, just being with the rhythm and the feeling of the walking. But I, I, you know, don't, like, like walking meditation is actually great because you can do any kind of meditation with it, right? It's not just one or the other, it's just a posture. So you can do any kind of meditation you like while walking. Does it get easier? Good question. <laughs> I was barely able to let go of my thoughts all day. Any advice for letting go in the face of deep resistance? Ooh. Well, I mean, I think that hopefully that the talk that I gave earlier will speak to that. But, you know, I think it's it's it's... Uh, interesting and I think really um, positive that mention of deep resistance at the end because when mentioning that then you're owning what's going on right and that's good that's a good sign my only advice for that would be have faith you'll be okay 
you know what's going on. And see, here's the thing about meditation. You sit in meditation and you think, oh, this thing's happening and my mind's like this and it's so scattered and all of these kinds of things. Like 99% of people go to their grave without ever even having the faintest clue of what's going on in their mind. To be able to realize that these thoughts are happening and they're coming from some deep resistance I've had, that's wisdom right there. Yeah? There's a lot of people who go to their grave without ever having realized that much. So because you understand that, that means you're on the path and you'll get there. So just don't, don't feel, don't get discouraged. Okay, so, um, is it time? Okay. Are the jhanas something to be cultivated and practiced, or are they just factors that arise organically when sufficient conditions are present? Is there such a thing as learning the jhanas on retreats? <laughs> okay, so... Yes, yes, and no. <laughs> no? Okay, so look, so okay, let, I'll, I'll just say a few words about jhanas. Uh, number one, okay, who knows what we're talking about when we're talking about jhanas? Is there anybody who, who doesn't know? Do you, do you know? You don't know? Excellent, thank you. <laughs> now, I would, you can excuse yourself from the room for this next little bit because I'm just going to teach a bunch of things that are going to help people to unknow the things that they know already. But anyway, that's fine. You can stay there. Okay, so so who, so anybody else doesn't know jhanas? What jhanas are? Excellent. Good. Everybody else? Good. Everybody else? We've got a bit of work to do. Okay, so can somebody tell me what jhana, what a, what jhana means? Someone give me a definition. Go on. That's an absorption state. Okay, so an absorption state. Okay, in meditation, good. Right, so jhana has different factors and it's a state of absorption in meditation. Pretty good, yeah, excellent. So the reason why I sort of expressed some hesitancy and so on, because jhanas have become a very controversial point, especially in, in recent American Buddhism. And look, I just want to say, like during the 90s when I first appeared in Buddhism and you know Ajahn Brahm and some of the teachers in my tradition started talking about jhanas, nobody was talking about jhanas. Everyone was just talking about vipassana in those days. And we started talking about jhanas. Now everybody's talking about jhanas, right? And so, oh well, that's okay. But a lot of the jhanas, a lot of the stuff that people say about jhanas, uh, well, Let's just say that jhanas are deep and profound and subtle. So what are, what, what are they? Briefly in, in survey is that the Buddha taught the Noble Eightfold Path, which I've mentioned before. Can somebody tell me the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path? Go. Number one. Right understanding. Yes, right. number two. Right, right intention. Number three. Right. No. Right. 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 Number three. No. Right. Number three. No. <laughs> speech, right, speech. Oh, Number three. Good. Number four. No. <laughs> Number four. Come on, come on. Number four. Effort, effort. No. Come on. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Popcorn. Right. <laughs> subway train. Right. Pizza rat. No. Right. What's the next one? After right speech. Right action. action. Thank you so much. Oh oh. Right. Next one. Uh, Livelihood. Uh, Keep going. You were almost there. <laughs> Sorry. Right effort. effort and mindfulness. Excellent. So I decided. <laughs> and the last one is right samadhi. Okay. Now, right samadhi is some the word samadhi in Pali is is where it's used in Pali is virtually a synonym of jhana, and both of them mean immersion or absorption. Okay. Uh, and right samadhi, the noble eightfold path, is always invariably defined as the four jhanas. Right, so four jhanas means four states of meditation, which uh, a meditator will uh, realize as a result of abandoning the hindrances. So the hindrances are the factors in the mind that obstruct your meditation. You know, all of that stuff you've been doing today, right? <laughs> that stuff, that's the hindrances. 
And when you let go of all of that stuff, then the mind goes into jhana. Okay? So that much, so, so far is pretty straightforward. Now, when the Buddha talked about jhanas, one of the things that he was very concerned to do was he demystified meditation. Okay? So before the Buddha came along, of course there was lots of meditation going on in India at the time. Right? All these different sages and yogis and things like that. But they always talked about meditation in a very kind of metaphysical way. right? So it's becoming one with Brahman or something like that. So it's like a way of talking about meditation. It's quite, actually quite a, a beautiful and inspiring kind of language. But it's not really very precise. It's more kind of an evocative language rather than a very precise language. So one of the things that the Buddha came along and said, well, actually, these things that you're talking about, really, we can understand these just in terms... We don't have to understand these in terms of some metaphysics or something, but we can just understand it in terms of the psych psychology. What's actually going on in your mind when you realize these things? And there are certain things that are absent from your mind, like desire and hate and restlessness and things like that. And there are certain things that are present in your mind, right? The joy and the happiness and the, the stillness of mind and mindfulness and things like that. So these are present. And so he defined these four states of meditation in terms of what is absent and what is present. So they're purely like psychological definitions of different states of mind. So uh, with the giving up of the five hindrances, the mind enters the first jhana and then successively more and more coarse uh, mental qualities are let go and then this is what we call like progressing through the four jhanas. Okay, so these four jhanas as a factor of the Noble Eightfold Path um, are an essential part of the Buddhist practice and essential part of the path to enlightenment. Now, uh, the way that the Buddha talked about, and of course, when, when the Buddha talked about it, like, like, see, if I go, if we, when we had our, our um, meditation interviews today, right, people came up and you talk about meditation, people come and sit there and say, and try to describe what happened in the meditation, and it's not easy. Right? This is one of the first things I mentioned today, that what I look for in a meditation student is how clearly that they can describe their meditation. Right? See, this is what the Buddha did. The Buddha described his meditation very clearly. Right? But think about it. You know, this is one thing that people sort of really sort of seem to forget about this whole thing. Think about how hard it is to describe your mind state to somebody else. I mean, even if you're in the same room with them. Right? You've got as much time as you like to be able to talk to them, talk about your meditation and all of these things. It's still really hard to be able to figure out are you really talking about the same thing or not. Somebody can say, oh, I was being mindful. Somebody else can say, I was being mindful. Are you talking really about the same thing? It's very hard to say. So, of course, there's room for interpretation and people have different ideas about what these different kind of states mean. Uh, and. Uh, so hence what is sometimes rather sadly called the jhana wars uh, where people get together and argue with each other about what jhanas are and uh, I just kind of look at it and shake my head and think well they're not getting jhanas <laughs> because if you've got jhanas you're not arguing about it anyway so jhanas are a state of deep meditation the Buddha called them the adhi chitta uh, and they are definitely something to be cultivated and practiced. Why is this even a question? Because in the 20th century there was a movement of Buddhism called the Vipassana movement which said you don't need to do jhanas. In fact, jhanas could even be harmful because you get attached to them. Ooh. And of course this is not what the Buddha taught and with deep respect to the Vipassana teachers for they introduced Buddhism to us and have done so much for us, my first retreat on a Vipassana retreat, but the Buddha always said the jhanas are something to be cultivated, to be practiced. And he said somebody who practices the four kinds of jhanas can expect four kinds of fruits, stream entry, once return, non-return, and arahant. So, but I think the purpose of the question here was that do you like deliberately set out to say I'm going to get these jhanas and do them and practice them? Or are they something that emerge organically through your practice, right? And, well, I think a bit of both. Like, I think that, you know, you can have a bit of uh, intention to do them, but mostly there's something that emerge organically from your practice, right? This is why when I'm teaching them, I don't really 
they don't really emphasize on teaching jhanas very much and you know I much prefer to talk to people where they are at and doing the right thing and laying the foundations for meditation is what is the causes for deep meditation and deep meditation really is nothing more than exactly the same thing that you've all experienced in your meditation when you've let go and you found peace it's the same thing but just more of it that's it just keep on going so that's the main thing is there such a thing as learning the jhanas on retreats i know this is kind of popular these days but no i don't really think that there is i think jhanas are yes i do people definitely do realize jhanas uh, but um, uh, you can't sort of it's just too unpredictable it's too you know people are too different you know there's a small number of people yes who might be able to go to a retreat and then realize some jhanas after a, after a longish retreat yes a small number but for most people they're not going to and to sort of push yourself and say this is the aim of the retreat or to expect that like everyone on the retreat is going to be getting jhanas is just nuts it's not going to happen sorry yeah and it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with it. it doesn't mean you have to redefine it or anything like that what it means is that you know you look at look at this look at the context i mean come on look at the context look at what the sages of old did they gave up everything and went into the mountains and into the jungles to live in a leaf hut for decade after decade to practice meditation and do you honestly expect that you can just like have everything and not give up anything and go to a retreat for a, a weekend or a couple of weeks and get the same state of meditation i mean <laughs> be realistic it's not going to happen it doesn't mean it's not good it doesn't mean we shouldn't understand them it just means that it takes time these things are very profound and remember what i said earlier that real spiritual progress is not about realizing some state of meditation even if you get jhanas on a retreat or something like that unless it's part of an organic spiritual development it's not actually going to mean very much it's just an, an experience that happens on retreat and you go away and it, you're back to normal much more important to focus on who you are as a person become a better person this is what I look for I mentioned this to Han in her interview and I'll say it again she'll be probably very embarrassed okay if somebody comes up to me in in a meditation retreat and says oh I've got this jhana or I've got that jhana it means nothing to me okay it means nothing I'll listen to it okay I'm not rejecting it I'm not saying that they don't or whatever but it's not very interesting to me it doesn't really tell me anything about who they are as a person when we caught the subway back from one of the events we did in town and we we're waiting at the station and there's some guy at the station and starts talking and things like that and this guy had been through a bit of a hard life and sort of talking about some of the issues and problems that he had and when, when Han heard that she, she was standing just behind him she immediately just came up and put her, put her hand very gently on his back and just supported him and, and gave him her love and when I saw that, I thought, now that is a person who is spiritually developed. That is a person who has love and wisdom and compassion. That's what matters to me. <laughs> okay. All right. Final question. So I'm... I'm if you want, I might talk more about jhanas later on, some later days on the retreat. I mean, you can ask questions about it if anybody's interested, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to because it just ends up devolving into just too much conversation, really. It becomes, gets very bro-ish. <laughs> <laughs> so my jhana's bigger than your jhana. <laughs> Uh, what exactly does form refer to? Uh, for example, the first skanda or the first form jhanas. Okay, so uh, so this is a bit of more of a technical and linguistic question. I'm, I'm I'll answer this question, but just you know, just so you know, it might be best just to more technical questions like this maybe leave for after the retreat or something. But I, I get it; it's okay if you want to ask them. That's all right. Uh, so the word form in Buddhism we translate the Pali word rupa. And the Pali word rupa is a general term for the material or physical aspect of existence. Now we use the highly unsatisfactory translation form for this uh, because, well, any other translation is 
more unsatisfactory. So there's that. So form has the basic meaning of something. The rupa has the basic meaning of the form or shape or appearance of something. Okay. So one of the meanings of rupa is what is it that you see? Okay. So you see a sight, you see a color. This is a rupa. That's the basic meaning. It also can mean a, a shape in the sense of like the Buddha rupa. So we have the Buddha rupa is a Buddha image, is we call a Buddha rupa. Yeah? So it's another word. It's also used as a more general word for the physical word, physical physical uh, dimension of existence. Now, what's going on here? This is a little bit subtle. If we've come from a, a Western background or a scientific background, we are used to thinking of the physical world, the material world, as being primarily something that exists out there. Okay? So this is the thing. It's, it, it has its own objective existence. That's what we're talking about. If we talk about matter or the physical world, that's what we're talking about. Whereas from a Buddhist point of view, Buddhist, Buddhist teachings are all about experience. So the question of whether something exists out there or not isn't really the point, right? I mean, philosophically, you can debate whether, you know, the world, an idealist point of view, does the world just live in your mind? Or a realist point of view, does it exist ex only out there? But a Buddhist point of view is really neither idealist nor realist, right? A Buddhist point of view is relationist, right? You see that actually our experience of the physical world comes when we become conscious of these physical properties. Whether the world actually physically exists out there is kind of irrelevant to that. So when we talk about something like the four elements, you talk about something like heat, right? So from a physical point of view, heat is a physical property, which is roughly equivalent to the motion of the vibrating of the uh, atoms. But from a Buddhist point of view, heat is the experience of hot and cold. It's what you actually feel like. You feel it's a property that you experience. So same thing with, uh, say, the, the sight, right? So sight, uh, from a Western scientific point of view, is photons. It's a particular kind of energized form of electromagnetic radiation. But from a Buddhist point of view, it's the experience of seeing. It's what you actually observe. So rupa, from a, um, uh, from a Buddhist point of view, essentially means the physical world, or physical properties that as they're observed or experienced in the mind. Right, so you're with me so far? Right? You're with me so far, everyone? So if I if I experience a feeling of heat, then this is a rupa of heat. If I experience a feeling of solidity, then this is a rupa of solidity. Whether that corresponds to anything outside of me is irrelevant. Right? I mean in some contexts it's relevant. Obviously, if you're walking into a wall, then it's relevant, okay? But in terms, but they're both kind of rupa. So then uh, in meditation, if I see a light in meditation, right, that light is also considered to be a rupa. Right? So a light is a rupa, it's a kind of form that I'm seeing in meditation. So it's a, it's a, it's in a way it's a physical thing in just even though there's actually no light there. Do you see that point? Yeah, it's about the in, inner experience of these things. So this is why the first we just talked a minute ago about the jhanas, the first four jhanas. And sometimes these are called the rupa jhanas, the form jhanas or form absorptions. And that's why, because those form absorptions are based on that experience of light, which is a rupa. And then the higher states of meditation, the arupa, is that light is no longer present. Does that make sense? Yeah, more or less, right? It's okay. If it doesn't make sense, that's fine. Whatever. I'm doing my best. I'm just not there yet. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Are you referencing to the four form attainments? That's correct, yeah. They're formless? Formless attainments, yeah. They sound very... Nor they, there. Sorry? Nor here nor there. Yeah, neither perception nor non-perception. They sound very cool, don't they? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one of the one of the things with the discussion about jhanas and so on, one of the points there is uh, leaving aside all the technicalities of it. Really, one of the issues is w when 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 we're meditating, how deep inside our own mind do we go? 
Now there comes a point in your meditation when the mind can completely withdraw from all of the five senses. And you like literally don't hear or see or smell or taste or touch anything. Mm. Huh? So some people talk about jhanas and they say, no, 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 that's not what jhanas mean. My jhanas, you still see, hear, smell, taste and touch things, but you're peaceful and not attached to them. Mm. That's what some people say. And the correct people say, no. <laughs> Did I say correct? I was trying to be unbiased. <laughs> and <laughs> Other people say, well, this is, this is still not really samadhi because samadhi and jhana actually are talking about a state of unification, a state of profound absorption. And in that state of prof profound absorption, there's only mind consciousness. Only mind consciousness. And all of those other things have ceased and that's why they're so blissful. This is one of the first, this is one of the things that Ajahn Brahm started talking about. He was really the first teacher, I think, to really start um, expressing like the, like the psychology and the understanding of like why these things were like, like in the, the books and the Abhidhamma books and things, it like talks about these things, but it just sort of says that they're like this and they're like this and so on. And he's saying, that, well, this is why, because they're about letting go. Right? So it's not, jhanas are not something that, that's like a thing that you go out to and you get. But always says, Vosagarama nankaritva labadi samadhi labadi chitta se kagatang. Dependent on letting go, one gains samadhi and reunification of mind. Letting go. And when you let go, your mind feels very blissful. And you realize that all of that dukkha, right? All that suffering. Oh my God. All that stuff that we're carrying around. This is what's like depressing the mind all the time. And when you let go of all of those things, the mind becomes so free and so light. Hmm. Okay? We good? I think we're good. So maybe we should wrap up for this evening.